When you finish the game, you have a lot of questions. Who are the giants? What did King Vendrick steal from them? Why does Nishandra need you to open the door to the throne? Why does the Emerald Herald want you to ascend the throne of want? Why doesn't Vendrick sit upon the throne of want? What is the throne of want? Now, all of this is really overwhelming, I know. But by the end of this video, you should at least understand my interpretation of events, and this can serve as a really good framework to build your own theories from. So, I'm going to start at the end and work my way backwards. Now, this might sound strange, but there is a reason for it, because most characters in Dark Souls 2 are driven by a desire, a want. For example, to understand Vendrick's hollowed state and location, you have to understand what he desired above all else, and how it led him there. To understand Nishandra's desire for the throne, we have to understand why it was so important to her, and to understand why the Emerald Herald drives you to become king, we need to know why she needs a new monarch. Do you understand? The reason we have these questions is because these character wants are hidden from us until the very end. That's why you got to the end of the game and you still had questions. Even the cursed undead you play as in-game is told that they will do these things without really knowing why. And you as a player are no different. The Firekeeper says it. But one day, you will stand before its decrepit gate without really knowing why. The Maiden says it. If you are to be the next monarch, then one day you will walk those grounds without really knowing why. Grave Warden Agdane says it. How queer are you humans? How you go on? Never separating truth from fiction. Do you see? As the ancient dragon says, the curse of life is the curse of want, and you peer into the fog in hope of answers. This game, more than any other Souls game, is about a search for answers. So this is great for channels like mine that interpret the lore, but it's likely really bad for the average player who has no idea what's going on. And I'd assume this focus on answers is why so many item descriptions have questions within them. Because they want to make you question the world you find yourself in. And so, we start with the Throne of Want. What is it? Well, first off, the Throne Room itself is a kiln. And to understand why it being a kiln is significant, you have to understand the principles of this world, and it just so happens that they're the same principles we found in Lordran in Dark Souls 1. In the Dark Souls 1 opening cinematic, we see the shambling forms of hollows. They're called that presumably because they're empty vessels, hollow. Then the first flame appeared, containing powerful souls. One hollow found the Dark Soul and used it to give birth to humanity. Another three found their powerful souls within the first flame, and one of these lords became Gwyn, Lord of Sunlight. His soul was power, and he ushered in an age of light and fire. In time though, this age began to dwindle. The brighter the flame, the shorter its life. And so the world began to darken. Everything fell apart around Gwyn, Lord of Sunlight. His city became abandoned, his trusted friends betrayed him. Demons were spawned when one of his fellow lords tried to relight the first flame, and humanity began to be afflicted by the curse of the undead. Undead are kept sane through their strength of purpose, and one undead took on an impossible purpose. He journeyed through the crumbling world and consumed thousands of powerful souls in the process, eventually gathering the strength to overthrow the fading Lord Gwyn. In the kiln of the first flame, where Lord Gwyn once linked the flame to his own soul, an undead with a powerful soul did the same. He links the flame to his soul like Gwyn did, and the flame consumes him, starting a new age of fire. Before Dark Souls 2, we didn't know what effect this would have. We assumed linking the fire would bring light back to the world, and we were right. We also knew that linking the fire is a temporary solution, as everything fades in time. But what we didn't know is that this process is destined to play out over and over again. It's a cycle. The dull ember, an item we come across in our journey, gives us a clue about the cycle of light and dark. An ember radiating a dull light. This flame seems nearly exhausted, but it exhibits an eerie resilience. Perhaps this is its ordinary state. I think this quote reflects the concept of light and dark in the game. I think it means that the center point of light and dark is around a struggling, spluttering flame. Gwyn linked the fire with his soul. This prolonged his age of light. Eventually it faded to its natural state, where there were only cinders. 
At this point, an undead comes along with another immense soul. He can either choose to link the flame and bolster the Age of Fire, or let it splutter and die and lead an Age of Dark. In Dark Souls 1, this is your choice. Whether you choose light or dark, it's possible that it doesn't even matter, because if you choose light, your age of light will eventually fade to cinders, and if you choose dark, you might smother the flame, but an ember will always remain in the ashes, waiting to be blown back into life. In Dark Souls 2, there's an item called Sublime Bone Dust. Its description says that it is the remains of a saint who cast himself into the bonfire, but we will never know for sure, for soot and ashes tell no story. This isn't just any old dust, it allows you to bolster the power of your Estus Flask, which heals the undead. It's also found numerous times throughout the game, in numerous locations, so it's implied that these are the remains of the chosen undead before you, the chosen undead who linked the fire before burning to dust themselves. Many kingdoms rose and fell on this tract of earth. Mine was by no means the first. Anything that has a beginning also has an end. No flame, however brilliant, does not one day splutter and fade. But then, from the ashes, the flame reignites and a new kingdom is born, sporting a new face. This tells us that the cycle has repeated itself numerous times. Many have sacrificed themselves to renew the cycle of light, and their ashes are found throughout the land. One after the other, without fail, a chosen undead resigns himself to the kiln to link his soul with the first flame. So it's my theory that the undead curse crops up once the flame begins to fade, so that eventually a fated undead will appear with the willpower to gather souls and link the flame once again. When you link the fire, you're also removing the undead curse from the world for a short time. But only for a short time, for when the world darkens, the curse appears again. The curse is a part of life itself. No one will ever be rid of it. And so there is only one choice. To await a worthy monarch. A monarch who can shoulder your burden. Lest this land swallow you whole as it has so many others. You are the bearer of the curse, but this means more than you'd think. You don't just bear the curse of the undead where you die over and over, but by linking the fire, you also bear the burden of this cursed world. You are the worthy monarch, who sacrifices himself so that humans can die instead of going hollow. Why do humans go hollow? Well, do you remember the hollows from the Dark Souls 1 opening cinematic? That seems to be their natural state. Some of these hollows found humanity in the first flame and became human. Reverting to your hollow state doesn't seem that unnatural when you consider that, does it? So as I said earlier, remember the throne room you enter at the end of the game? Look at the design, it's a kiln. Just like the kiln in the first game, it exists to house the first flame. A kiln used to change the form of something with heat. The throne and the room itself is covered in ash, and as you enter, the Emerald Herald tells you that you can link the fire, should you choose to do so. The giant's kinship reads, Each king has his rightful throne, and when he sits upon it, he sees what he chooses to see. Or perhaps it is the throne which shows the king only what he wants. So this is the effects of the ending. For now, simply know that it represents another cycle taking place. You are sitting upon a throne, and the throne is but a symbol of power and choice. The power and choice that lighting the first flame gives to you, as you can decide how to reshape your world. The Emerald Herald says that once the fire is linked, the souls you've inherited will flourish anew, and inherit new bodies, and all of the events that just occurred will play out again. The Age of Fire will be bolstered, and the undead curse may disappear, but in time the fire will fade, and eventually, a new undead will come along, bound by fate. She then says it's your choice to embrace or renounce this. And like in Dark Souls 1, you have that choice to embrace light, or to reject it and let darkness come. The only difference between Dark Souls 2 and Dark Souls 1 that I can see is that in Dark Souls 2, we aren't able to make the in-game choice of linking the flame or walking away from it. And when you think about it, why would we need to make that choice in-game? Because now we know, regardless of what we choose, you, as a player, know the cycle will start over again. Great Sovereign, take your throne. What lies ahead? 
only you can see. Now that you know what the Throne of Want represents, you can really understand the stories of those who would sit upon it. So click here to view part 2, which is about Vendrick, Nishandra, the Herald, and the world your player character goes through as you play the game. I really hope that you enjoyed this video, but in my opinion, the best stories are in part 2. I'll see you there.